Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Jisha Jun in Beijing, and today we're continuing our exploration of the history and development of Quenchi Opera, one of China's oldest and most popular performing arts. Quenchi Opera can trace its origins back to the Ming Dynasty about 600 years ago. During the Qing Dynasty that followed, it became so popular that it was said to have an influence at every level of society from the imperial court down. Emperor Qianlong was a big fan of Quenchi Opera. Famously, he even took a role in one performance staged in the Forbidden City. Emperor Kangxi was a great Kunshu opera fan, but so too were many emperors who came after him. In the time of Qianlong, there were no less than 1,400 actors and actresses in the royal palace. Nanfu, the institute in charge of opera entertainment for the royal family, was the largest royal troupe in the world. In his book Huan Yuan Shi Lu, Geographic Information About Beijing, early Qing writer Wu Tai Chu stated, Inside the inner city wall in front of Jingshan Hill at the northwestern corner, there are more than 100 houses in which dwell actors and actresses working for Nanfu. Their area is commonly called Suzhou Lane. Kunshu had been crowned the state opera, and with this, it enjoyed a status unmatched by any other form. Inside the Forbidden City, many stages on which operas were once performed can still be seen. Ningxiao Palace, Chunghua Palace and Shou An Palace each has its own opera stage. The second largest inside the Forbidden City can be seen in Chunghua Palace. Inside one of the palace rooms, there is a smaller one called Feng Ya Tuan. Emperor Qianlong himself once played a role on this stage to release his passion for Kuen Xu. But stages of various sizes can be seen in other places frequented by the Qing emperors. The Summer Palace, Yuan Ming Yuan Garden and the Royal Summer Resort in Chengdu, for example. Six of these are very large, having three stories, large enough for over a thousand actors and actresses. During the years of Emperor Qianlong, Kun Chu highlights as a form greatly matured, but the emperor didn't stop at this. He even organized a large-scale script-writing campaign. In 1779, in the 44th year of his reign, a group of scholars well-versed in melodies and script-writing gathered in Yangzhou. Tunes and poems collected from across the nation by Suzhou officials poured into this newly established group, and they then adapted them for Kun Chu. Five years before this, Qian De Tang, a native of Suzhou, spent 12 years compiling a collection of popular highlights, no less than 446 of them. Most of the highlights we see today were recorded in this collection.
The Emperor's writing campaign lasted four years until 1782, at which time a voluminous work entitled The Sea of Highlights was produced. It contained no less than 1,113 highlights staged in the Ming and Qing dynasties. Thanks to this great book, many Kuen Chu highlights have been passed down to the present age. Many classical titles we know today have survived simply because they were performed as highlights year in and year out, and these highlights provided an archive of music drama from which would rise Peking opera. But first, Kuen Chu highlights enabled a multitude of forms to flourish. Over 600 years ago, Kun Shan Tung, the predecessor of Kun Chu, began to take shape in the township of Chandong in Kun Shan municipality, Jiangsu province. After Kun Chu was listed in the first group of oral and intangible cultural heritage items in 2001, many people came here to trace the early steps Kun Chu had taken. Shandong is really the birthplace of Chinese opera. Because of Kun Chu's unique position in opera history as the ancestor of all other opera forms, of the more than 300 opera forms in China, it came above all the others as the candidate to be put forward for inclusion in UNESCO's list. Because he's old, 他的这个剧本的文学性非常高昆曲 Opera is regarded as the ancestor of all operas in China. A good example is Yuezhu Opera. During its evolution into a popular form of local opera, Yuezhu drew considerably on Kunqu Opera. Shangxian in Zhejiang province is the birthplace of Yuezhu Opera. When the earliest form of Yuezhu appeared here, it was made up of folk tunes people sang in the countryside. Yuju Opera began its evolution due to the performances of two storytellers in a village named Dongwang in 1906. By 1944, Yuan Xuefen had gained quite some fame at the age of 22. But she knew that the path Yuju would have to take to gain widespread acceptance in Shanghai would be long and difficult. In the 1940s, the Shanghai entertainment industry entered a period in which many different genres became popular. But as movies and dramas were entering their golden age in the city, Yuan Xuefen and her colleagues decided to imitate certain aspects found in them and stage a number of modern plays. But they were to be disappointed, as audiences simply didn't like them. It was then that Yuan Xuefen thought about taking a look at Kun Chu. Zheng Zhuan Jian had entered the Suzhou Kun Chu workshop at the age of just 11, and he'd gone on to major in old male roles. Half a century had passed since the reform of Yue Ju, and by 1996, Zheng had passed away and Yuan Xuefen was in his 80s. Ni Chuan Yu was the only one still alive from what was known as the Chuan generation. 
The sound of the flute can no longer be heard coming from the former site of the Kuen Chu workshop, but memories of his days there remain fresh in the mind of Ni Chuan Yu, who was a close friend of Zhang Chuan Jian. When Yuan Shufen founded her Shuasheng Yuju troupe in 1944, she hired Zhang Zhuan Jian as its technical director to teach dancing moves. Zhang Zhuan Jian was responsible for creating all the dancers for the new Yuju dramas. And under his guidance, Yuju performances became not only more elegant, but also standardized. Today, it is hard to pinpoint the exact features Yuju opera gained from Kun Chu, but this dance in the story of Liang Shenbo and Zhu Yingtai perhaps gives us an inkling of what Yuju borrowed from Kun Chu. Yuan Shufen described Kun Chu as Yuju Opera's wet nurse. It was not only Yuju opera that borrowed from Kun Chu, other forms did as well. Performers of Suju opera and Huju opera invited Zheng Zhuanjian and his friends from the Chuan generation for help. The Chuan generation was in its prime during the 1930s and 40s. But one may ask why it was that these talented professionals in the prime of their lives were working for other opera troupes as mere tutors. From its days of glamour marked by a grand gathering of Kuanchu professionals in Huzhou, Suzhou, to its decline before the liberation, what happened to Kuanchu? Why did it yield its leading position to Peking Opera? The answers lie in the years the performance of Kuan Chu highlights lost popularity. Chen Long, the fourth emperor of Qiang, was a great lover of Kuan Chu opera. In fact, as soon as he took the throne, he had a number of stages built inside the Forbidden City and arranged for more than 1,000 professional performers under a special department called Nanfu to be ready at any time to entertain him. Whenever he went on a trip, Local officials would beat their brains wondering how best to please the emperor, and this was usually through performances of Kuan Chu opera. In a volume entitled Grand Tour in the South, housed in the National Library, we can examine detailed records of Qian Long's fifth visit to South China in the year 1780. When he arrived in Yangzhou, it was spring. When the Imperial fleet was just five kilometers from the dock, a eunuch informed Qianlong of a giant peach that had been set on the riverbank near the dock. At the Emperor's instruction, the fleet sped toward the dock and just as they approached, 
hundreds of fireworks shot skyward from around the beach and then split open to reveal a stage on which hundreds of people were singing and dancing. This elaborate spectacle, called the Mountain of Longevity and Sea of Happiness, had been arranged as a surprise for the emperor by rich Yangzhou salt merchants. Opera troops from other places made their way to Yangzhou to learn from the many dramas being performed there night and day. But what were the genres of entertainment the Yangzhou salt merchants prepared for the emperor? The following is found in a volume entitled Records of Pleasure Boats in Yangzhou. Salt merchants prepared two programs, one being refined Kuanshan tunes, the other miscellaneous. Miscellaneous included tunes in different styles from Peking opera, Qinxiang, Yiyang, Bangzi, Luo Luo and Ahuan. Historical records tell us that by the time of Emperor Qianlong's visit to the south in 1780, other forms of tune had gained popular acceptance. Sufficient, apparently, to challenge quench opera's right to be performed on important occasions, such as welcoming the emperor. Yet quench opera continued to be defined as the refined the form, while the others were merely miscellaneous. Among the genres falling into the miscellaneous category was one particularly eye-catching form, Anhui Opera. Anhui opera sung using local Anhui melodies would be the predecessor of Peking opera. As it happened, most of the young Zhou salt merchants came from Anhui, and they were powerful enough to retain a troupe and fully finance it. Naturally, Anhui opera had absorbed a great deal from other forms. With Yang Zhou as its base, troops performing Anhui opera traveled up and down the rivers giving performances. And over time, it developed the potential to challenge Qin Chu's dominant position. In the book mentioned earlier, all the opera forms and other types of entertainment are documented with almost equal regard. With so many competitors, Kun Chu began to lose ground. In books on the history of Chinese opera, this competition is called the rivalry between Kun Chu and the miscellaneous. In the later years of Emperor Qianlong's reign, Chinese opera history entered what is known as the 100 Flowers Blooming Period. With their invigorating melodies, Anhui troops brought a breath of fresh air to the stage, and Kun Chu began to decline. Eventually, Kun Chu lost its glory and its position. The very literary merits that had enabled Kun Chu to become highly successful were now a hindrance. Scholars had tired of singing in the Suzhou dialect, and some even noted that Kun Chu audiences were dispersing while booing loudly. Yangwanghadan 
，为什么京剧能够取代昆曲吧？我们从这方面来看，京剧一个是它的这个题材通俗了，而它的唱词呢直白一些了，就让人不是特别难理解了。The decisive factor in this competition among the genres was to take place on stage in the nation's capital. In the year 1790, Emperor Chen Long turned 80, and according to custom, all local officials were required to make their way to the capital and there offer him their best wishes. To fulfil this duty, an official by the name of Gao Langting set off from Yangzhou by boat along the Grand Canal, and he brought with him to Beijing his Anhui Opera Troupe. Gao Langting was already quite famous, and he enjoyed the favor of the emperor. The Grand Canal ended in Beijing, or more precisely, a busy part of it known as Haizhou. Gao Langting well knew that any troop gaining recognition in the capital was certain to become popular nationwide. Naturally, he was very keen for his troop to cause a sensation. As it happened, the performances of miscellaneous tunes presented by Gao Langting's troupe were superior to all the others. He had the success he wanted. After this, three other Anhui troops came to Beijing, and so this event is described as the four Anhui troops coming to Beijing to make history. Documentation concerning this can be found in the classic book *New Events in the Capital*. The appearance of the four Anhui troops in the capital marks the birth of Peking opera. And this form, of course, quickly gained national popularity. But with the great success of Peking opera, Kuen Chu quickly went into decline. This Kuen Chu script, found in the archives of the Chinese Arts Research Institute, was written during the reign of Emperor Xianfeng, long after the reign of Emperor Qianlong. By that time, Kuen Chu highlights were not being staged in the palace at all. The fate of Kuen Chu was, to use the words of a passage in the script, in a helpless situation. But yet more ill fate was to befall Kuen Chu. By the first decade of the 19th century, the Qing Dynasty was approaching its final years. The empire was plagued by incessant wars, wars that significantly weakened the empire and contributed to the disappearance of Kuen Chu from the stage. Kuen Chu troops in Beijing were going through a difficult time. In fact, performers were finding it hard to make ends meet. With Kuen Chu no longer the exclusive genre on the stage. Kuen Chu performers were having to accept having to share the limelight with others. Chinese opera was entering a period in which genres were becoming intertwined, with each form learning from the other. But these newer forms were, in reality, being nurtured on the milk of Kuen Chu. Kuen Chu was the chief influence on the more recent genres, and foremost among them was Peking opera. Kuen Chu. 在他的历史上积累了很丰厚的财富，变成了很重要的文化遗产、非物质遗产。他的呢，他要转移了，实现他的转移啊，转移呢，转移到京剧里头去了。从谭鑫培，从梅巧玲，从再往上，那从宫里的他是有昆曲的，他已经把昆曲的元素输入到京，就是你等于你你身体里的血液有这个有这种基因了，讲。Quen Chu opera entered a period of decline at the beginning of the 19th century. Strangely, this coincided with the time of prosperity for Chinese opera as a whole. Even so, Quen Chu's influence remained strong. Much of the stage art of the new operas was adopted from Quen Chu, as was a large part of the classic repertoire. Even some of the performers moved to the new operas. Still today, being a master of two arts is still one of the standards for judging the artistic achievements of a Peking opera performer. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. Tune in again next time when we'll bring you more about the history and development of Quenchi opera. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. See you next time.